As we gather here in the mystery of this hour, hear these words by an anonymous writer. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, and to each other. Our opening words come from the Reverend Dr. William F. Schultz. Come into this place of peace and let its silence heal your spirit. Come into this place of memory and let its history warm your soul. Come into this place of prophecy and power and let its vision change your heart. As we light this chalice, let me point out some astonishing things to which we often become blindly accustomed. Oil becomes flame, light, and heat. Sage becomes smoke and smell. Sunlight becomes life. Brown earth becomes green pine needles and yellow and purple flowers. Mouse becomes eagle. Food becomes dance and thought. Ideas become material form. Child becomes adult. Shy becomes bold. My internal thoughts become sounds. Those sounds received by you become your interior thoughts. Let the chalice flame then remind us that this is a world of becoming, that what we receive we transform and give again. The transformation is the very stuff of life, and that each of us is an astonishing combination of astonishing transformations. Welcome to the August 23rd, 2020 online worship service at the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos. I'm Rebecca Howard, and I'm a worship associate for this congregation. Our minister, the Reverend John Cullinan, is taking a well-deserved vacation and will return August 31st. Today, I'm delighted to welcome our pulpit guest, James Carroll. James is a scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory, he has a PhD in statistical machine learning and a minor in ancient Near Eastern history. He is a student of comparative religion and mythology. James has served on the Religious Education Committee at our church and for several years has taught adult RE classes on comparative religion and biblical scholarship, and he has been our pulpit guest on a number of occasions. So welcome, James. As Unitarian Universalists, we affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person and support a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here. 
Today, I'd like to extend a special welcome to anyone who is joining us for the first time. If you'd like to know more about our church, as well as learn opportunities to connect during the week, check our website, our Facebook page, and or sign up for our email announcements. You can contact our church office for more information. The church, uh, oh, that website is uulosalamos.org, and the information is also in the service notes below. If you're watching on Sunday morning, we invite you to join our Zoom coffee hour after the service at 11. The information for that was sent out in our email announcement and is on our Facebook page. Whether you are visiting us for the first time or have been part of this congregation for years, may this time we set apart from our everyday concerns help us to see what is most important to us in ourselves, in each other, and in the world around us. In the words of the well-known Buddhist teacher, Jack Cornfield, there are 10,000 joys and sorrows in every life, and at one time or another, we will be touched by all of them. Each week brings joy and sorrow to our own lives. We may come here today with our hearts soaring with joy or our hearts heavy with sorrow. The loss of the ability to travel to visit friends and family or the chaos and confusion of the events in the wider world and in our own communities may bring a sense of sorrow. We may also come here today with joy in our hearts, joy in a story told to us by a child, or the sight and sounds of a hawk soaring over a canyon, or simply taking a walk in the cool of the evening may all bring us joy. Let us take a moment now, as two candles burn in our sanctuary, to bring to our minds and hearts the sorrows and the joy that we carry with us, whether spoken aloud or held quietly and tenderly within. This is the story of how Supergirl really did help someone. A story based on true events from a Twitter post. Adapted by Tina Theo. Once upon a time, in a place called Fort Wayne, Indiana, there lived a woman named Mary who owned a comic book store. Owning a comic book store has got to be a fun job. 
Mary really liked to help people find comic books. One Saturday, a teenage girl came into the store. She went straight to the new comics shelf and looked very overwhelmed and stressed. I can't find what I'm looking for. Mary went over to the young girl and asked, Can I help you find something? Well, I'm trying to find Supergirl comics. They both walked to the Supergirl area. And Mary asked the girl if she watched the Supergirl show. Have you watched the Supergirl show? Oh, yes. Alex, Supergirl's secret identity, is my favorite character. Alex is my favorite character, too, said Mary. Then the girl starts to burst into tears. Oh my gosh, what did I do? Why is she crying? Mary thought. Then it clicked in Mary's head. This young girl is queer just like Alex, a.k.a. Supergirl, is queer. Mary shares that it was hard for her to come out queer, too. Does it ever get easier? The young girl asked. Mary shares her coming out story with the young girl at the store's coffee bar. When Alex came out in the comics, I knew then that I was queer. I had felt sad and depressed for so long until I saw that Alex's character could be queer and happy and loved, said the young girl. When I read Supergirl, I felt strong and happy as a queer woman. I had no idea gay or queer comic book characters existed. Mary then told the young girl about that woman and Apollo and Midnighter and Detective Renee Montoya. The girl asked, do you know some comics I can read to get me through the Supergirl show TV show break? Mary gave her lots of different options of comics to read with queer characters. But I only have money for one comic. No worries, said Mary. I will buy the other three comics you want. But you have to promise me in ten years that you will help another queer kid. Deal. Thank you, thank you, said the young girl. And that is the story of how Supergirl and Mary, the comic book store owner, helped a young queer girl feel strong, happy, and accepted. The end.
Reading number one. Stories are mechanisms that human beings evolve to help us package information about who we are, how we survive, what we care about, and then spread these ideas through time and space. Liz Neely. Reading number two. Well, when I was nine years old, Star Trek came on and I looked at it and I went screaming through the house, come here, mom, everybody, come quick, come quick. There's a black lady on television and she ain't no maid. And I knew right then and there that I could be anything I wanted to be. Whoopi Goldberg. In March of 1992, I was 16 years old. I just turned 16 a few months ago, and at 16, I could now drive. But even more exciting, I was finally old enough to date, at least according to the dictates of our fundamentalist religion. So I dutifully began the ritual of taking girls to various high school dances. Taking a man to a dance was unheard of. Not only would the school not have allowed it at the time, neither would my fundamentalist religion. Homosexuality was an abomination, a sin, and I was a child, so I believed what I was told. Luckily for me, I liked girls, so this wasn't really a problem. Several of my friends, however, were gay. At least two of the people in this group photo were gay. I had no idea. After all, here they both are, dating girls along with the rest of us. None of them dared to tell me at the time, and I admit with some shame that telling me would likely not have been safe. But I was shy enough that girls still scared me. I was a nerd who had a blast attending space camp, and my head was mostly in the stars where I dreamed of one day being an astronaut. Every week, our politically and religiously conservative family would gather around the TV and we would watch my favorite TV show, Star Trek The Next Generation. It was perfect. It had everything. Exploration, science, an android robot, aliens, laser guns. They called them phasers. And a beautiful woman. At least, I admit. I was a bit shallow at 16. But on March 16th, 1992, the episode my family sat down to watch was titled The Outcast. The episode discussed an androgynous species, 
where most have no gender. However, one of this new species, named Soren, tells us that, quote, among my people there are a few who are born different. They say that they feel like they're female, a throwback to a time when her species had gender. She falls in love with a male member of the Enterprise crew named Riker but is tragically outed to her bigoted people who capture her, put her on trial, and then forcefully expose her to their version of reparative therapy. Her story ends in tragedy, and by the time Riker breaks the rules to try and rescue her, it is too late. The gendered female he fell in love with is gone because, in this world, the reparative therapy actually works. Soren is cured and becomes a standard they. But we see this cure through Riker's eyes as the murder of the person he loved. This is what science fiction can do at its very best, because it has the freedom to posit completely new species with alternate cultures and even alternate biology. It can invert and invert many of the stereotypes of our own culture. This sort of cultural inversion can serve as a mirror. In that mirror we see ourselves, but often in a very different light. Because the roles were inverted, our cis straight conservative family could empathize with Soren. But the lesson involved how we were treating others. Even then, I didn't completely miss the point. I never forgot Soren's stinging rebuke to her persecutors at the end of that trial. All the loving things that you do with each other, that is what we do. What makes you think that you can dictate how people love each other? Her words pricked my conscience, and they planted the seeds of doubt that would stay with me for the next 18 years before they finally grew. Myths are incredibly powerful things. I've always been interested in mythology, especially from the ancient times, cultures, and places. These strange supernatural stories always fascinated me. I wanted to know, what did they mean to the people who told them? And why did they think they were so important? Did they really believe these things? Or were they fiction? Metaphor? What role did they play in the lives of the people who told them? I spent years trying to answer some of these questions, but the more I know, the more questions I have. The scientist Liz Neely studies narrative and story, especially in the context of science, education, and communication. She says that the narrative storytelling is an evolved and essential human trait. There's a lot we can say about the science of narrative. Science is about numbers, figures, graphs, but people don't respond to numbers in a pretty chart. They respond to narrative. So effective science communication requires that we translate all these facts and figures into stories that people can relate to. Narrative, trans narrative transportation is a term for what happens to us and our minds when we get really lost in a really, really good story. We stop paying attention to what is happening around us and as our minds become engrossed in the story. When people are deeply transported, their brains aren't just processing the language they're hearing or reading. Other areas of the brain are extremely active, including areas relating to perspective taking, motivation, imagination, future prediction, and even regions relating to physical sensations. As we strive to understand the motivations of the characters in the story, we come to see things from their perspective. Empathy is created, and that's what allows people to shift attitudes so that they can come out of the story and back into the real world and think about things differently. One key element of cognitive behavioral therapy is the realization that sometimes the narratives we spin around an event can be more powerful than the event itself. The same exact event can produce extremely different internal react reactions depending on how we frame that event with our narrative thoughts. A really good therapist can help us reframe our internal narratives in more healthy ways. Narratives function in society much like words and language but they can convey far more complicated and abstract meanings than just cats are cute. Consider the meaning conveyed by my reference to the narrative of Romeo and Juliet. We need a shared vocabulary or language to communicate with others, but we don't just talk to others. We use words to shape our own thoughts. We talk to ourselves. And the words available in our vocabulary can shape or even limit the range of concepts we can understand. Narratives function in a similar way. That is the power of myth. Myths are essential both to our own range of thoughts and to our ability to communicate with others. And to do that last part, myths must be shared. So that's just a few of the things we know about the power of myth and, and story. There's a lot more we can say. That when there's a lot more, we still have to learn. But we know enough to know 
how deeply essential mythology and narratives are to every aspect of our lives, thoughts, relationships, and to our culture. Fortunately, today, we no longer have that shared vocabulary of myth. We no longer tell many of the myths of the past. Instead, we're creating our own modern myths. These days, we tell stories of fantastical superheroes with fantastical powers, of unrealistic romances, wizards, magic rings, hobbits, and vast treasures, dangerous dragons, or of knights fighting in space. Sometimes the non-fictional lives of people crystallize into narratives that can function in a society in the same way as these stories. These narratives, either fictional or factual, can dramatically shift how we see ourselves as a society, and they can motivate social change. The immense volume of stories available to us today is both a blessing and a curse. On the one hand, there's, there is sure to be a story out there that will speak to us and to motivate each of us. But the proliferation of narratives and genres also means that it is increasingly likely that if you make a reference to your favorite story, the person you're talking to may not understand. Many who point this out want us to return to a single shared dominant myth, usually one of their choosing, but I believe this particular ship has sailed, and this is unlikely. I believe that what we need instead is an increased patience and a willingness to listen to people as they explain the stories and narratives that they find motivating, to step outside of our own comfort zones, and to learn the stories of others, even if those stories are not our own. This realization has motivated much of my interest in the myths, religions, and stories of the past. I've taught several courses on comparative religion or on the Bible at this church over the years, and for those interested, a link to the YouTube channel with recordings of some of those classes and lectures will be in the video description. But we don't just need to learn about the stories of the past. We need to learn and tell stories from the present and from our future, and we need to create even better stories that include even more people. Like anything else, there are both good and bad myths out there. Examples of the many problems from modern media are everywhere, and we all know what they are, given what we know about the power of narratives and media. I think we should take this seriously. You know the problems. Depictions of women are often objectifying. If they're represented at all, often they're simply absent. The Bechtel test is one way to measure the representation of me women in media. It asks three very simple questions. First, are there two named female characters? Two who talk to each other. Three, about something other than a man. This graph shows the fraction of movies that pass each of these three elements of the Bechtel test. Although we can see improvement over time, the realization that nearly all books and movies would pass a reverse Bechtel test demonstrates just how uneven our representations are. There's nothing wrong with a book or a film that does not tell a, mo a woman's story, but there is something terribly wrong with a society that so rarely does. It's important that we do a better job. We have seen the power for good the diverse representations in the media can have. We all need to be able to see examples of people like ourselves playing important non-stereotyped roles. I have collected dozens of stories from women in leadership roles today who say that they were inspired as children by seeing powerful women depicted in positions of leadership. In comic books, science fiction, of, if comic books, science fiction, and fantasy are the modern myths, and there have been many instances where these stories have been intentional vehicles for social justice. In 1968, Stan Lee, the prolific comic book author, wrote that, quote, Racism and bigotry are among the deadliest social ills plaguing a world today, but unlike a team of costumed supervillains, they can't be halted with a punch to the snout or a zap from a ray gun. The only way to destroy them is to expose them, to reveal them for the insidious evils they really are. This belief was obvious in the, main, in the many heroes and villains he created. This vision was also shared by Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek. X-Men is about civil rights. Black Panther is about civil rights. Captain America literally fought Nazis. The Empire is in Star Wars is fascist and the Rebel Alliance is Antifa. Deadpool is queer. He's pansexual. Star Trek is about equality for all genders, races, and sexualities. 
they champion diversity, with arguably the first interracial kiss on network television. Chekhov was Russian, Sulo was Asian, Sisko was black, and Janeway was a woman. Gene Roddenberry said that he did this on purpose. Superman and Supergirl, and a whole host of other superheroes, are immigrants. The stance of these comics is pro-immigration and pro-equality and pro-acceptance. Michelle Nichols was the actor who played Lieutenant Uhura on Star Trek. According to her, she was offered another position, and she considered leaving the show. She actually wrote a letter of resignation and gave it to Gene Roddenberry. She says that he asked her to take the weekend to think about it before she left. That weekend, she attended an event where Martin Luther King Jr. was speaking. She says that she believes in destiny. He asked to meet her and introduced himself as her biggest fan. When she said she was leaving Star Trek, he simply told her, You cannot. Don't you know how important what you're doing is? She was convinced and decided to stay in her role that would eventually inspire Whoopi Goldberg and countless others. Years later, the franchise they created would air an episode that would begin the process of changing the heart of a privileged white youth. There's a tendency to think of fiction as something frivolous or unreal, but the effects it can have on our society are quite real. These things are not just stories. There are modern myths. These stories are the mirrors we use to see ourselves and the vocabulary we use to understand and to talk about our world. We need better stories, and we need more of them. And we need them to be better. We need stories with diverse representation where people of all races, colors, and sexualities can look and see themselves with hope for their futures. And for those of us like myself, with plenty of representation in the media, we need stories that will challenge us to think about the world in a different way. Those are the stories that make us better human beings. These are the fictional stories we tell to make sense of the factual world. These are our modern myths, fractured, diverse, but beautiful. Here in this religious community, we receive gifts that nurture body, mind, and spirit. Our offering is an opportunity to share some of what we have with the wider world. Even though we are unable to meet in person, <clears throat> we continue to take an online offering each week to support our community partners. Our offering recipient for the month of August is the Los Alamos Family Council. The Family Council promotes emotional and social well-being through education, prevention, and counseling, and serves Los Alamos County through their Counseling Center and their two Youth Activity Centers. Please use the link in the notes below to make your direct donation. Thank you for your generosity. May what you give bring you joy. Be now my vision. O oh God of my heart, nothing surpasses the love you impart. You my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, your presence my light. Be now my wisdom and be my true word. Ever within me my soul is assured. Mother of a father, you are both to me. Now and forever your child I will be. Riches I need not nor life's empty praise. You, my inheritance, now and always. You and you only are first in my heart. Great God, my treasure, may we never
I lift my eyes to the mountains. Ah, from where is help to come from? Help comes from the Eternal, who made heaven and earth. The Eternal guards you, sheltering you. The Eternal will protect you as you come and as you go, now and forever. Go in peace.